and uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's actually my first time to India, to Delhi, to the ITSA, and I'm very happy to finally be here for the first time, and I hope it's not the last time. It's, uh, in a way, it's a, it's a little bit funny that Xu Bo is using Western IR theory to understand East Asian regional order, and I'm trying to understand Chinese philosophy to understand what China, Chinese foreign policy uh, is made of. So sort of maybe we should have switched uh, <laughs> our presentations, but um, that is what I'm trying to do. I worked for nearly 10 years now on China foreign policy, particularly on China Central Asian relations, and also the last couple of years I focus specifically on the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, actually, in 2013, when Xi Jinping announced this initiative, I was in China trying to conduct interviews on China-Afghanistan relations, and I traveled to several places uh, and universities uh, trying to, to talk to the experts about these questions. But after the speech by Xi Jinping, everyone wanted to talk about Belt and Road, uh, one, belt, one road at that time still, uh, at least in the translation. And um, and it was very interesting because at that time everyone was sort of confused. So what is this about? It was really vague. There was this new initiative, but there was no content to it, so to say. And um, from that time on, I'm sort of uh, engaged with this topic uh, every more or less, so to speak. And there are a couple of things that personally annoy me, which is uh, which has to do with what I'm uh, doing at my institute back in Berlin. So we uh, also advised and talked to many policymakers, and uh, I attended a lot of conferences on the Belt and Road Initiative, but also last year when Germany had the chairmanship of the OECE, there were a lot of conferences on connectivity. Um, that was the European translation of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. They used the term connectivity. and. Um, and there's one thing that always comes up when you start talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, and that is the first question, what is, what is it all about? And um, in a way, policymakers and also academics are still asking these questions. I'm probably academics, I mean Western academics, and I, I personally think it's the wrong starting question because, as I said in the beginning, it, it was very vague. Uh, maybe until today it's too full uh, to, to actually uh, answer this question. Um, in one or two sentences. The second problem I see is that the Belt and Road Initiative is usually downsized. Then that means we talk about specific aspects of it. We talk about the, the, the China-Pakistan economic corridor as if this is uh, somehow representing the full idea behind the um, Belt and Road Initiative, although it's only one, even though one of the major projects of the initiative. We talk about certain mechanisms like the AIIB, as if this is the representation of the um, of the Belt and Road Initiative, or even single actors that are becoming more and more important uh, in this initiative. So this is also sort of confusing every time when you discuss this issue. Uh, and maybe a more general thing, and that is something that we have discussed the whole day, that, uh, well, at least that is something I realized when I listened to all the questions uh, of the Indian colleagues and diplomats, um, that, of course, China is becoming a driver of politics, and not only uh, in Asia, but also in Europe, and the Belt and Road Initiative is probably the tool or the instrument that made us realize that China is becoming a driver of politics and that it's not the other way around, uh, so to speak that not uh, Europe is driving the EU-China relations or that maybe other Asian countries are driving the relations with China, but that China is actually actively uh, driving these relations more and more. So what's missing in this whole debate uh, about it? Uh, I'm, I'm calling out these uh, a couple of things, but I'm mainly focusing on my, in my presentation on the first part, on the conceptual approach. Um, this is actually really missing. There's not much. There's a lot of talk about the Belt and Road Initiatives, about the projects, about the actors, who is involved and who is who is left out. But um, there's no real approach to conceptualize these uh, these these this initiative, and uh, also not in China. I think there are many debates about what you can do with the initiative, but not really trying to conceptualize it, use any kind of theoretical approach or or um, so somehow integrated in the, in the whole foreign policy um, initiatives of China. 
Then um, what's also missing is that we don't really monitor all these Belt and Road projects. It's sort of confusing because many projects already began before the in initiative uh, was announced, particularly in Central Asia. And today they are somehow still connected to, these, to this uh, initiative. And we are not really monitoring uh, what is actually going on under this, uh, this project. And when I, talk, when I say we, I mean it's not particularly the European Union or, or, the, or Germany, but also other countries, even in Asia. There's not, there's not any kind of uh, monitoring of this project except for, for, for some Chinese new think tanks. Uh, and what would be very interesting to focus on the projects that, act, that actually fail in this regard, because that is also difficult actually to, 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 to monitor. And of course we need more exchange about this, and more importantly we need to include um, more um, people from, uh, yeah, from, from entrepreneurs, from companies, from states, uh, from state-owned companies in China, but also from companies uh, uh, of the countries that are involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. Having said all this, I'm really only focusing on the first part because um, I'm just uh, interested and I'm thinking about this for a very long time, how to actually uh, theorize and conceptualize the, the Belt and Road Initiative, how to build some kind of an ideal type uh, as a conceptual device to understand what we are talking about and maybe also keeping in mind how this, and this is uh, the topic of, of my talk today, how this might have an, a special effect on, on, on how the world might look like in the, in the future. And in doing so, I'm referring to, to some Chinese traditional and cultural embedded notions. Um, that is the part where I rely on Chinese uh, maybe philosophical think thinking because uh, if you use, um, let's say, um, Eurocentric approaches like regionalism or when we talk about institutionalism then uh, and you try to understand what the Belt and Road is then uh, and you go to China then you always hear the criticism that it's something different and uh, so I try to use Chinese uh, conceptions so that um, probably we can differentiate from what is happening empirically and what is probably um, empirically and maybe can differentiate from this ideal type to the, to the uh, empirical evidence. So I'm focusing on this initiative and not really trying to put this into the broader perspective of China's foreign policy and we can still discuss this uh, if there's time in the Q&A. So the main principles I'm focusing on to build uh, this kind of an ideal type of the Belt and Road Initiative is a notion that was actually um, uh, introduced by Fei Xuetong, uh, and he's focusing on the social order of, of China and explaining the, the network relations actually has a lot of in common with what John Gent also mentioned, but coming from a totally different uh, perspective from that regard. It's a Chinese idea of social networks and their hi uh, hierarchy. And um, the second part is sort of linked to this idea of Cha Xu Gu Zhu, um, it's a traditional understanding of the core and periphery understanding. We also talked a little bit, we heard a lot, a little bit about this, about the, the relationship between the core and the periphery, and I'm trying to um, link this together. It's, um, someone mentioned uh, Zhao Tingyang, I think Chu Bo, in the, in the lunch break, and um, I rely on his understanding of this particular notion in Chinese traditional understanding. So um, Fei Xuetong, he established this uh, in the beginning of uh, the last century. So this is really um, describing traditional Chinese networks. And what I'm trying to do is adopting this to sort of our world today and translate it into international politics. Um, I know that this always is a problem. You cannot really do this one on one, but I think it's helpful to understand the, the idea when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative as a global network or something, someone, I think you mentioned the word connectivity strategy. So, so if we use these terms, maybe this helps us to understand from a Chinese perspective what this could mean for the people who are the sort of the end point of the Belt and Road Initiative. So this um, understanding of hierarchy means that there is a core surrounded by circles. Uh, each person is at the center of this, of this network. And the relationship between the core and the other is determined by the context and uh, the specific quality of the relationship. So if you think I'm the core now, and every row is sort of a, another circle of this relationship, so maybe the persons in the first row would be very close to me because 
in, in a traditional social order would be probably family. And then we would uh, go to friends and maybe working relations and so on and so forth. If we think about states, it could mean that uh, we have uh, a treaty, signed a treaty and have good relationships or partnerships or uh, be part of the same institutions and agree to the same norms. So this is something that needs to be specified, but it just uh, should give you an idea. And it's important that this is defined by the relationship in, in from my perspective as, as the core to the other and not, for instance, by a social organization that binds us together or social values that binds us together firstly and then sort of defines the relationship within this organization. So Fei Xiu Tong says, the structure of Chinese society is like ripples caused by throwing a stone into a pond. Each person is situated at the center of a set of concentric rings of water which extend to the edges of that person's social influences. No matter when and where one finds oneself, one is always situated at the center of this flexible social network. So following this understanding, the key is the relationship between me and others, which defines the network. There's not the norm, value, or rule, or rights uh, that defines this order. It depends on the specific con context. It's absolutely uh, depending on the context. This is similar to the relationship between the monkey and the banana. This is uh, an example from Nisbet, A Geography of Thought, a book he published in beginnings of 2000. And um, he is actually a psychologist and made some, some experiments with uh, Western uh, people and Chinese people. And they, he showed them a picture of, of animals like monkeys, dogs, uh, and I don't know, maybe something else, and a banana. And the, the Western uh, participants, they always uh, put all the animals in one group and the banana outside of the group. As, but the Chinese group, they always uh, linked the monkey and the banana because there's a relationship between the monkey and the banana because the monkey likes to eat the banana. So this is, uh, this is sort of uh, somehow the thinking behind this that you always have this relational and if Ching Ching would be here, he would probably give some extended view on, this, uh, on his understanding of this specific uh, view of uh, international order then. So this is the, the, the idea behind um, this understanding of Guanxi or network. Um, putting in the second principle is about the core periphery relationship. It's not exactly the translation of this uh, term. This term actually is also used a lot of times when it comes to One Belt, One Road in many, many of the official um, documents or even reports. I haven't counted so far, but it would be very interesting to, to, to do that. Um, and it basically means that it's not, it's not understand in a purely spatial sense. It's not that there's the core and if we go further, that the, that my rela that the relationship between the core, if I'm here and the people in the very last row, um, are, it's not defined by this kind of spatial sense that the, that the people sitting in the last row are probably the ones, are my enemies and the ones in the front are my, my, my friends. Um, but of course, uh, but it's, uh, it's also defined by, by the specific quality of the relationship again. So, so there could be, for instance, and I say this is always, it's, it's still in the progress of thinking, there could be a state that is not a neighbor state, maybe far, far away from China, but still could be a very important part within the Belt and Road Initiative, could be therefore uh, at a specific locateness. This is something that uh, Brantley Womack used. Uh, and therefore specifically important to the, uh, to the whole idea of the Belt and Road Initiative and therefore very important. And in the relationship, this, this state would be very close, of course, in a different sense of speaking. So it refers to the sentiment also of the acceptance by the distant ones. This is important for this specific principle that it's not only from my perspective at the core to the others, but also that the other accepts the core, of course. and. Um, and therefore also uh, sort of enter into this relationship. So they have to accept that I'm at the core at some point of this, of this deal. And that is also very important when we look at um, the Belt and Road Initiative and also the moment of sanctions in Chinese foreign policy at the moment. Mm. I'm not going to explain this, it's just showing you, you an example of, of a Chinese colleague I've, who recent, recently published an article about um, 
trying to use this model of Cha Xu to, to define China's relationship with other countries using the term good relations. And he's counting, I think, um, China daily reports. And um, I'm, I'm not going to explain what states are close to the core, but it just gives you an idea that we need some kind of uh, principles on the right side to, to define the relationship between China and the other uh, countries. And it would look like this. And in, in this particular example, um, he, he, he made this uh, in, in sort of distinguishing good relationships in several terms, like good partners, good, uh, good uh, friend, or, uh, and so on and so forth. There are several notions. But when we turn to the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, then we have, to, we have to look at other qualities when we define this relationship between the core and the, and the other, so to speak. And um, I mean, this is definitely not the end of my thinking. As I said, it's a work in progress. So these are some ideas I have to define this quality. And the first one would be the geographic location. But in the meaning of what Brantley Womack said in locateness, it's really more about the meaning of the, uh, the changing meaning of location and its importance within this uh, initiative. That means we have a lot of economic hubs. We have more transit regions and more talk about transit region and states. So this means the location, specific location of the, of the area, um, really it's, uh, or, or states or cities, is important to the relationship or to the import, for the importance of this country within the framework. Also, secondly, the particip uh, participation at important summits. I mean, we have the BRI, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative Forum in May. Uh, some of the countries India, for example, didn't participate. That also had an impact on the relationship between China and India. And, um, but India, for instance, is very important to China. That's why we have some kind of a um, charming uh, uh, initiative from, from, the Chinese, uh, from the Chinese government towards India in certain sense, even though there have been these incidents in the Himalaya. This is, uh, this is very interesting. Um, so. This, the third point would be the involvement in organizations that are summarized under the Belt and Road Initiative. As I said, the AWB, the SEO. For Europe, it would be the 16 plus one. But there are also others, uh, the New Development Bank, BRICS from a Chinese perspective, even though at the latest BRICS summit that was a little bit, uh, they n never used this officially, but, from, but in all some of the official documents, you find the BRICS under the Belt and Road Initiative, and also the view that when India joined the SCO, that they sort of also agreed to the Belt and Road Initiative, even though this is not the case from an Indian perspective, but still, you have this kind of narrative around. Then, of course, bilateral agreements. Uh, many, many of the memorandum of understandings that have been signed in all this time between several countries and China. Um, and also the uh, rhetoric or practice or if you are supportive of the Belt and Road Initiative. Like, for instance, Germany is rather critical about this idea of connectivity uh, with a specific core, and they have been critical also uh, our uh, uh, economic ministry. She had been very critical at the Belt and Road Forum in, in Beijing this May. But on the other hand, the trade between China and Germany is very important. So in practice, like some of the logistic companies in Germany, they even used the term Belt and Road to make profit out of it. So um, you see, it's not always only the government. Um, so this means at some point that when we, when we look at these um, qualities of relations and we think about the broader picture and the spatial effect of Belt and Road Initiative, then that uh, from a Chinese perspective, they are sort of, um, I, t I called it remapping, uh, remapping the world, but in a way it's sort of reorganizing the world. They are talking about trans-regional corridors instead of regions and states and, and, and cities. Uh, cities are still important, maybe not, not uh, regions and sub-regions. So they are sort of using the Belt and Road Initiative to um, define specific economic corridors and also define the role of the specific countries within these corridors. So this is something that you need to keep in mind. You have to understand of what corridor you are a part of and then how this actually plays into the whole idea of the Belt and Road Initiative. And I mean, I like this map. It's not maybe not very clear here, but this map is, is 
it's not a Chinese map. There's no, uh, no, not a real official Chinese map. But this map is interesting because you don't have any borders anymore on this map. It's some, it's a, it's sort of what I think is going to happen. You have somehow a blurry China with with the with its boundaries, and you have Europe at some point at the end point, at least for the for for the for the road part of for the, for the Eurasian part of the of the Silk Road Initiative. But in between, you have a landmass, and this landmass is sort of organized by these corridors. And um, even though this might not be the intention when you look at this and you keep the idea of the network in mind, then uh, of course this is going to maybe not tomorrow and maybe not in five years, but it could change the understanding of regions and also the particular structure of the Eurasian landmass and also the various regions that are in between. And I think this is, this is something that is definitely, uh, I cannot look into the future, but I think it's slowly happening because we are already referring to the corridors. We are, and when I say we again, I mean the countries uh, that are part of the Belt and Road Initiatives because they sort of make the Belt and, Ridge, uh, Belt and Road Initiative what it is for us. And, and they are referring to these corridors when we talk about, I don't know, West Asia. We hear something about this, I think, tomorrow. So West Asia is not really part of these this anymore because you have several corridors that are covering West Asia and maybe Iran is going to be a very important spot in the Belt and Road Initiative as a hub uh, but it's somehow connecting um, one, one, one node if you want to say with another one so it's uh, so this is really changing how how probably the former order or map of the world has has been looked uh, has been out there for a long time Yes, I think um, it's, it's, as I said, I'm, I'm still um, thinking about this and I'm, I wanted to present it here because I thought it's a very diverse audience um, because it's, it's still, of course, not all thought through well enough, but I think it's really something we need to think about. We need to see the whole, the, 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 the bigger picture of the network and what a network from a Chinese perspective really means and how this actually changes the, the existing understandings of structuring um, the world that we are still living in. Thank you.